ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Six Flags Q1 2021 Earnings Conference Call. My name is Catherine and I will be your operator for today's call. During the presentation, all lines will be in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question at that time, simply press star and then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Steve Pertel, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Good morning, and welcome to our first quarter 2021 call. With me are Mike Spanoff, President and CEO of Six Flags, and Sandy Gretti, our Chief Financial Officer. We will begin the call with prepared comments and then open the call to your questions. Our comments will include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, that could cause actual results to differ materially from those described in such statements, and the company undertakes no obligation to update or revise these statements. In addition, on the call, we will discuss non-GAAP financial measures. Investors can find both a detailed discussion of business risk and reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP financial measures in the company's annual reports, quarterly reports, and other forms filed or furnished with the SEC. At this time, I will turn the call over to Mike. Good morning. Thank you for joining our call. We have divided our call into three parts. First, I will provide an overview of our recent operating performance and the strong demand trends we are seeing. Second, Sandeep will go into more detail about our financial results and give an update on the progress of our transformation plan. Finally, I will return to discuss why we are excited about our future over both the short and long term. I am pleased to be able to report that the 2021 season is off to a strong start, despite the significant challenges due to the pandemic. Last year, we were the first company able to safely reopen a theme park in North America. This year, we had the first theme parks open in California, and in many cases, we have opened our parks earlier than in 2019. We have either opened or announced firm opening dates for all of our theme parks, with the exception of Montreal. This is due to the creativity and adaptability of our Six Flags team, who worked hard to establish the highest standards of cleanliness and safety protocols. I'm also pleased to report that our guests are excited to return to Six Flags, and we are seeing strong demand across all of our markets. I've spent the last couple months visiting many of our parks, which has allowed me to connect with our great team members, understand reopening challenges, reinforce our priorities, and examine the effectiveness of our operations. My time with our outstanding park leaders only reaffirms that we have a highly capable team, a healthy industry, and a resilient business. Our full-time team members appreciate that we stood by them throughout the crisis and did not conduct furloughs, and they are excited to welcome back our guests to our parks. They are leading admirably in a complex operating environment. The signs of strong consumer demand for our parks are very clear. Through this past weekend, our year-to-date attendance trends have accelerated at our open parks, increasing to 79% of 2019 levels compared to 51% in the fourth quarter of 2020. We are seeing strong guest spending per capita, and our active pass space has surpassed prior year first quarter levels, placing us solidly on track towards recovery. We have centered decision-making squarely on our guests, extending privileges for season passes and memberships, while also offering high-tiered benefits to our members who continue their payments, and they have rewarded us with their loyalty. Experiencing such robust demand at this time of year does present operational challenges, however. We have encountered difficulty fully staffing our parks upon reopening, with a shortage of labor availability due to many factors including school COVID schedules, immigration restrictions limiting the number of international temporary worker visas, and extended unemployment benefits keeping people at home. We expect these labor challenges to start to abate as we enter the core of our operating season. At the same time, the overall operating environment remains challenging as we balance the requirements of delivering a safe experience during the pandemic while still delighting our guests. Our safety protocols have reduced ride throughput, which can result in longer than normal lines and less rides per guest. We are continuing to require masks in our parks, 
but we'll constantly assess this policy in partnership with our industry, the CDC, and local health officials. We are also working with local health officials on eliminating constraints around park capacity and ride seating as more Americans receive their vaccinations. Our outdoor venues have a tremendous amount of open space. Therefore, our parks are naturally conducive to social distancing, and all states are supportive of working with us to safely increase attendance levels. Our recent results and guest surveys indicate that there is extraordinary demand for outdoor entertainment options close to home. And we believe that this widespread desire will help drive attendance in the coming quarters. We see this as a golden opportunity to welcome new guests and delight our loyal fans. So we are focused on opening all of our parks and delivering a great, safe guest experience. So while it is still early in the season, we are pleased by recent trends and are optimistic about both the short and long-term prospects of our business. In the first quarter, we also continue to make progress on our transformation plan, which focuses on strengthening our core business, and we are on track to achieve our previously issued financial targets. I will now turn the call over to Sandeep, who will provide details about the quarter as well as our transformation plan and results. Sandeep? Thank you, Mike, and good morning to everyone. I want to start by stressing that results for the first quarter are not comparable to prior year because we closed all of our parks in mid-March last year prior to the spring break for most of our parks. For that reason, I will provide comparisons to 2019. Total attendance for the quarter was 1.3 million guests, a 38% decline from first quarter 2019. Revenue in the quarter was down $46 million, or 36% to $82 million. Because of our fiscal quarter change, our first fiscal quarter 2021 ended on April 4th instead of March 31st, as it did in 2019. As a result, our 2021 results include four calendar days in April when many of our parks operated, during which we had 293,000 of attendance, and this was inclusive of the Easter holiday weekend. In 2019, the Easter holiday, which affects the timing of spring break in many of our markets, occurred in the second quarter. So far, through this past weekend, year-to-date attendance at open parks is trending at 79%, versus 2019. This trend includes the spring break period in both years and is a better representation of our run rate so far this year at our open parks. As a reminder, our second fiscal quarter in 2021 will end on July 4th and will include a majority of the July 4th holiday weekend which will shift attendance out of the third quarter and into the second quarter this year relative to our calendar in 2019. Total guest spending per capita increased 16% in the quarter versus 2019. Since the beginning of the membership program, a portion of the membership revenue has been allocated between admission spending and in-park spending. Beginning in October 2020, the company prospectively began allocating an incremental portion, resulting in a reduction in admission spending per capita and an increase in in in-park spending per capita, with no change in total guest spending per capita. Applying a a pro forma allocation to 2019, admission spending per capita increased 17%, and in-park spending per capita increased 14% compared to the first quarter of 2019. The increase in admission spending per capita compared to 2019 was driven primarily by higher realized ticket yields for both single-day tickets and the active pass base as our revenue management team focused on leveraging our pricing and product mix. The increase in in park spending per capita compared to 2019 reflected high consumer demand for our products. Attendance from our active pass space in the first quarter 
represented 54% of total attendance versus 64% for the first quarter of 2019, demonstrating a more balanced approach to ticket sales. On the cost side, cash operating and SG&A expenses versus 2019 decreased by $29 million, or 20%, primarily due to the following. First, cost savings from our transformation efforts. Second, savings in labor, utilities, and other costs related to the fact that several of our parks were not operating. And third, lower advertising costs. Adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was a loss of $46 million compared to a loss of $32 million in first quarter 2019. Gap loss per share was $1.12 compared to a loss of $0.82 in 2019, primarily due to the lower attendance in our parks. We are pleased with the retention of our active pass base of 4.1 million pass holders which included 1.7 million members and 2.4 million traditional season pass holders at the end of first quarter 2021. Our active pass base is up 1% compared to first quarter 2020 and down only 9% compared to first quarter 2019. As we reopen our parks, we are steadily reducing the number of paused members to near zero. The retention of these members is a testament to our unique offering and loyal following. Looking ahead, we expect the active pass space trends to continue to improve as we have begun selling new season passes and memberships. Our very large active pass space is a tremendous asset for our company as pass holders generate more annual revenue and cash flow than single day visitors. They utilize excess capacity as they tend to visit during off-peak periods and shoulder months. They also provide a weather hedge since they pay in advance and have the ability to visit for the entire season. Finally, our members provide a source of recurring revenue that smooths our cash flow and makes our earnings less seasonal. Deferred revenue as of April 4, 2021 was $245 million, up $96 million, or 65%, compared to first quarter 2020, and up $67 million, or 38%, compared to first quarter 2019. The increase was primarily due to the deferral of revenue from members and season pass holders, whose benefits were extended through 2021, and the acceleration of season pass sales over the past few weeks of the quarter. We expect to recognize most of this deferred revenue in 2021. The capital expenditures for the quarter were $23 million. We expect our full year 2021 capital spend to be slightly lower than 2020 due to the carryover of new rights that were delivered and paid for but not commissioned in 2020. Our liquidity position as of April 4th was $524 million. This included $461 million of available revolver capacity, net of $20 million of letters of credit, and $63 million of cash. This compares to a liquidity position of $618 million as of December 31st, 2020. Net cash outflow for the quarter was $95 million, representing an average of $32 million per month. This is significantly better than the projection of $53 million to $58 million per month that we gave on our last earnings call. This improvement was driven by higher than expected attendance and season pass sales. Based on our anticipated park schedules, we expect to be cash flow positive for the balance of the year and will not be providing a quarterly outlook on cash flow going forward. We are obligated each April 
to offer to purchase the outstanding partnership units from the unit holders who own the third-party interests of Six Flags Over Texas, Six Flags Over Georgia, and Six Flags Whitewater Atlanta. Less than $1 million of value in units has been put to Six Flags during the current year tender period that will end later today. I would now like to give you an update on the progress of our transformation plan. We expect the transformation plan to unlock 80 to $110 million in incremental annual run rate EBITDA once fully implemented and attendance returns to 2019 levels. In 2021, we expect to achieve 30 to $35 million from our organizational redesign and other fixed cost reductions. We have already re realized more than $8 million through the first quarter of this year. As part of our transformation plan, we have incurred $44 million in costs so far through the first quarter of 2021, including the non-cash write-offs of $10 million that occurred in 2020. We expect to incur the remaining $26 million in 2021 and 2022, the majority of which is related to investments in technology, including a new CRM system. We continue to make progress with our revenue and cost initiatives as shown by the positive impact on our attendance, per capita spending, and cost savings. Our new revenue management team is up and functioning as we focus on leveraging pricing and product mix to drive incremental unique attendance and yield higher admissions and in-park spending per capita. We launched more than 20 RFPs as part of our non-headcount cost savings initiatives, and we are seeing very promising results, especially in procurement savings. We began migrating towards centralized shared services in finance IT, and human resources, and we began testing our new park labor scheduling system. In closing my own remarks, the operating environment remains dynamic. We will not be providing annual guidance at this time. However, we are extremely encouraged by the improvements we are seeing in our attendance trends and the value creation that will come from implementing our transformation plan. We feel we are well positioned as we enter the heart of our 2021 operating season. Now, I'll pass the call back over to Mike. Thank you, Sandeep. Innovation is in our DNA. In 2021, we will be introducing several record-breaking and first-of-their-kind rides, including the Jersey Devil Coaster at Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey, the world's tallest, fastest, and longest single rail coaster inspired by New Jersey folklore. Tsunami Surge at Six Flags Great American Illinois, which will be the world's tallest water coaster. And we are reintroducing West Coast Racers at Six Flags Magic Mountain in California, the world's first racing coaster with side-by-side -side tracks, which is the park's 19th coaster. In addition, we are rebranding our water parks in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and Rockford, Illinois to Hurricane Harbor and creating a separate gate for our water park in Gurney, Illinois, creating our 27th park. Finally, due to its popularity, we will continue to operate our drive-through safari in New Jersey as a separately gated attraction. The park successfully opened in March, creating the longest season in the safari's history. We will also be investing in our park infrastructure, adding technology to help us modernize the guest experience, and in specific areas like food and beverage to help us improve our overall food quality and efficiency. In addition to new ride and infrastructure investments, we will be introducing numerous new events and festivals in our parks this year. Some examples include Roller Coaster Power Hours, an event held on Thursday and Friday evenings when a limited number of guests can ride roller co coasters nonstop while listening to a live DJ. Our Mardi Gras Festival, which continues to grow in popularity as one of our tent pole events, and a bigger than ever July 4th Fest, which includes fireworks and in-park events. 
I believe Six Flags is well positioned to delight our guests and to create significant value for our shareholders. In the near term, my optimism is based on a few factors. First, reopening progress. We have approval to operate nearly all of our parks either today or in the near future. And we have proven in several markets that we can safely operate our parks without capacity restrictions. So we expect to gradually ramp our capacity back to normal levels while adhering to social distancing and other safety protocols. Second, consumer demand is very strong. Attendance at our open parks continues to accelerate as U.S. consumers are eager to get out and have fun. And Six Flags sits squarely in the middle of everything a consumer is looking for right now. Our venues are extremely safe. They are outdoors and provide ample room for social distancing. Our safety standards and protocols have been recognized as best in class by all state, city, and county officials. In addition, the vast majority of our guests drive to our parks, so we are not dependent on air travel. Third, our active pass base continues to grow, which positions us well for the upcoming operating season with a built-in base of guests. As I mentioned in my opening statement, we are proud of our high customer retention and customer loyalty. Customer loyalty is a very powerful competitive edge of Six Flags and one that provides a valuable recurring revenue stream. Over the long term, I am optimistic for several reasons. First, we have a unique value proposition. Our combination of thrill rides and entertainment for the entire family provides a truly unique experience and an affordable form of entertainment that is resilient even in difficult economic periods. In addition, our parks are located in each of the top 10 markets in the U.S., giving us access to the biggest and most lucrative markets around the country. Second, our transformation initiative will fundamentally improve our guest experience and our profitability. We are already seeing the early benefits in our improved single-day ticket mix, our in-park spending growth, and cost savings from our leaner organizational structure in our procurement efforts. But we're just getting started, and we are on track to deliver the full $80 to $110 million of incremental EBITDA when we are back in a normalized operating environment. Third and most importantly, we have a talented and dedicated team of people who have created a guest-centric culture. Our team members have exhibited tremendous resiliency during a very challenging period. Our organizational design resulted in a strong balance of theme park expertise and outside industry perspectives, which will help us stay true to the past while embracing the future. The strength of our people is truly why I'm confident that our future is bright. We, we believe the strategic actions we are taking to transform our company will drive our growth and enhance shareholder value. I look forward to updating you on our continued progress, and as we ramp back up to normal operations, you can expect to hear about our progress in our three key strategic initiatives, to modernize the guest experience through technology, to improve operational efficiency, and to drive financial excellence. Catherine, at this point, could you please open the call for any questions? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then the number one on your telephone keypad. And your first question comes from the line of David Katz with Jeffries. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks for taking my question and all the commentary. Uh, Mike I, I, and, and Sandeep, I just wonder if you can, you know, comment yet at this point about how you envision the mix of visitation between, um, you know, membership and pass holders versus single-day visitors, and you know, any insight on what you would consider to be kind of an optimal mix. So, so, David, I think that's a great question, and uh, I think we, we actually probably touched on this a little bit in the last earnings call as well. Uh, what we see as very encouraging uh, is the penetration of single-day tickets, which is a sign of pent-up demand um, as we came out of the fall in, of last year and then into the first quarter of this year, where you can see that there's a, a big tick-up uh, with the weight of active pass dropping from 64 to 54, uh, driven by single-day tickets. That's great. 
But we've always said, and we'll continue to actually emphasize, that single-day tickets were an opportunity that we called out in the fourth quarter 19 earnings call, but it's an and, not an or. So we also have a very robust active pass space. And if you actually went through our, our comments just now, we're very mm-hmm. encouraged because our active pass space is, is not returned to growth. We're up 1% against 2020 and up uh, and down 9% only against 2019, despite the lack of uh, spring season pass sales. So, so where we are is we're looking for balanced growth. We're looking to grow single-day tickets. We're looking to grow the active pass space. And, and I think this this healthy growth will be what we expect to see the dynamic of as we move to grow overall attendance and overall per caps with balanced approach in, in all cohorts. Uh, and if I can just follow that up, I, I I recall the, you know, and rather than or. If we think about the growth rates of each of those two buckets, um, it, do you expect one – should we be expecting the single day to grow more than the pass base, or is that, you know, still TBD? And, David, another great question, because if you've looked at the trend in the last few quarters, it's clear that single-day ticket uh, has actually outpaced uh, versus active pass base, which has made sense because we were underpenetrated on single-day tickets. As that starts to normalize, I think you'd see – more balanced growth between all the cohorts. But I think we still uh, obviously had some runway on single-day tickets, which is manifested in the weight of single-day tickets that you've seen so far. Um, but I expect that as time goes, this is going to really start normalizing. I appreciate that. And one last one, if I may. If I were a, a regular uh, Six Flags customer, and I'm not quite that cohort at this stage of life, but – uh, what would I observe in terms of the F and B change this year versus what I might have seen, you know, prior to COVID? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question, and 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 the key is prior to COVID, uh, uh, we introduced something really exciting last year, uh, just around the time COVID broke, and and we started reopening in the summer, which is the mobile food ordering, and and I think that mobile food ordering option continues to be enhanced and rolled out uh, as we actually go into the heart of the operating season. And and that is a, a pretty big change that uh, is now going to be seen for the first time in some of the parks, uh, effectively, that have not been open uh, like in California. And so that's exciting. I mean, it's uh, it's something that we continue to refine and improve uh, as, as things go along. But that would be one big call out on the F&B side that we've talked about previously. The other is part of our transformation initiative. We've talked about uh, expanding the assortment of the food offerings, and specifically in Texas, we talked about this previously as well. We've rolled out uh, new assortments and exciting offerings, and and the the take-up has been excellent uh, on what we've actually rolled out. So uh, you see this manifesting in the per caps. I mean, we've seen very strong uh, per caps on IPS, and and this reflects um, the, uh, the attraction uh, the attractiveness, sorry, of our, of our offerings in park, and it's also combined with a desire to spend. There is pent-up demand and there's disposable income well, with the propensity to spend from our guests who are coming into the park. So it's all, it's all a win-win uh, from that perspective. Thanks very much. Good luck. Thanks, David. Your next question comes from the line of Eric Wald with B. Riley Securities. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, two questions, if I may. I guess one, just a follow-up on the um, uh, the last questions around um, uh, kind of the, the active pass space and season passes. I guess if, if you look at um, trends in the start of the year, you know, memberships being flat, but season passes increasing from you know two one to two four. Um, how, how should we think about those trends? Would, would, would you have expected you know both season passes and memberships to kind of increase at a similar rate or? You know, more people migrate to memberships, or is this kind of what you've been expecting given how you're marketing those two plans? Uh, so, Eric, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I think I'm, we're actually extremely encouraged that membership is uh, pretty much flat as we go from Q4 to Q1. And I'll tell you why. Um, we had close to 20% of our members on pause at our closed box. And, and that was um, uh, until we actually got reopened. And as we've been reopening, we've been taking members off of pause. So, 
uh, now I think we're we're down to five percent uh, in terms of pause members, and and as we open up all our parks, that'll go to almost nil. So it, it's really testament to the fact that as we've taken off pause and and effectively uh, payments have been restarting for those pause members, we haven't seen an attrition rate uh, on the membership, and and I think um, as we actually move into the peak of the operating season you'll actually see that, that headwind go away and new membership sales to basically take off and, and grow. Whereas in the case of traditional season passes, as parks were reopening and um, and, and the season was beginning to get uh, get more traction, uh, we saw the natural demand come through and we sold uh, traditional season passes uh, in the first quarter. So it's encouraging. I think it's just more of the dynamic of how we're coming out of COVID. Um, and that uh, that you saw in terms of the balance between membership and season pass, but we're pleased with uh, the direction of both both numbers. Perfect. And then last question: you know, with California, with you know, Governor Newsom giving the green light for for businesses to return to 100% occupancy or 100% capacity um, on June 15th, how do you expect your parks in the state to to play into that? Are you planning to move to 100% on that date, or still more gradually throughout the year? I mean, on, on this, Eric, uh, the reality is our, our parks have been operating 100% capacity in Texas, Oklahoma, and Georgia already, and we've demonstrated that we can very safely operate in those states. So so as far as we're concerned, we've already got the playbook. We're demonstrating that we can do it. And, and I think at the moment, uh, um, states like California uh, lift capacity restrictions and are, and are able to let us operate at full capacity, we're very confident we can get there pretty quickly or immediately. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Your next question comes from the line of Steve Wazinski with Stiefel. Yeah, hey, guys. Good morning. Um, so, so Mike or Cindy, wanted to see if you could provide us with some some color, uh, you know, or feedback that you've gotten from guests during recent visits. And you know, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is. Uh, you know, Mike, you talked about the lower ride throughput and potential longer wait times for rides. And so is this something that, you know, guests at this point are kind of okay with and they understand it? Or, you know, are they showing up, they don't like it, basically meaning they potentially would delay visits and, you know, until some of these capacity limitations, uh, you know, are eventually removed? Uh, Steve, good morning. How are you? Um, good. Uh, you know, so my, my direct uh, interaction with the guests and what I'm reading is, is very consistent across all geographies. Uh, the, the first is um, they're just really excited and appreciative we're open. Um, the, the second is they, they actually quite understand the COVID safety protocols, um, and they've articulated that uh, quite well uh, through surveys as well as in, in, in personal interactions. Um, they're also clear on two other things, which we're working collaboratively with all the uh, state and local county governments. Um, the first is uh, they do want to get on more rides per day, and they understand that the safety protocols of cleaning the coasters and in some states uh, where we're not seating every row um, is a frustration. And then the other issue that has been a frustration, which we mentioned in our prepared remarks, is as we're ramping up staffing, we have seen longer lines, which uh, I'm not happy with at the food and beverage uh, locations. But that will abate as the season goes. Uh, but uh, we are focused on working with the states and the counties. They all want to work with us to expand uh, the park capacity and also with the, up, the guidance we've seen out of the CDC to allow um, – less constraints on ride capacities in other areas of the park. So we're, we're very uh, confident uh, we're going to continue to see progress as we see more vaccinations throughout the nation. Okay, gotcha. Thanks for that, Mike. And then the second question would be around the in-park spend, and it, it obviously continues to be very strong, and we've seen that across – you know, a lot of other verticals that, you know, that we're looking at. But, you know, how do you guys think or maybe talk us through how you guys are thinking about the, the, the way the in-park spend will, you know, will kind of move through the rest of the year? And, you know, I guess, again, what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, are people coming in just loaded with stimulus money and other things like that, and that should start to abate, you know, through the summer? Or do you think the consumer right now is just so healthy that, you know, you would expect kind of current run rate levels to, um, you know, to, to be maintained through the rest of the year? So, so, Steve, I think uh, in-park spend is actually, like I said in my uh, previous answer as well, 
very robust. I think we've introduced a lot of innovations and improvements in terms of product offerings, uh, both in terms of easy transaction, like in the mobile food ordering, and in terms of the assortment with the example I gave in Texas. So uh, there's definitely uh, an enhancement to the assortment and the ease of transactions for the guest that is uh, an enabler. Uh, to the point that you're making, uh, guests are loaded with disposable income, and that's great. And, and I think um, the propensity to spend is high, and, and we expect that tendency to continue to play out. I don't think it dries up anytime very quickly. Uh, it's uh, It's been a year of pent-up demand that I see is manifesting, and I think we're, we're likely to see that. Uh, the key over here, though, is um, when does it start um, basically normalizing? Uh, I think you're, you're going to see that at some point. We definitely see... Um, uh, food and beverage was a big opportunity pre-pandemic, and we called it out in transformation as one of the unlocks of value that we see. And uh, so we we do see growth. The magnitude of it, I think, will just uh, will bear itself out as time goes along. But it's definitely going to be growth. And, and I would I would say growth versus 2019, because that was where we were pre-pandemic. Understood. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Tyler Battery with Janie Montgomery. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Good morning, Tyler. Just uh, one question from from me. I just I wanted to circle back to the comments on on labor, if if I could. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Talk more about uh, um, how you might address some potential shortfalls uh, in the labor pool that might be out there, and, and what are you seeing in terms of uh, wages as well? So, great question, Tyler. And I think Mike touched on the fact that uh, uh, definitely, as we as we start opening up, we've been experiencing labor shortages, and uh, there are a few factors uh, like that like Mike mentions: um, the school COVID schedules, um, immigration restrictions, the number of international we, um, temporary worker visas, and then I think the extended unemployment benefits combined with the stimulus checks are incenting people to stay home, stay home more in the short term. And so I think uh, from that perspective, the shortages that we experienced manifested in the food and beverage line that Mike just mentioned uh, and other areas in the park as well. But um, but I think we do have a plan. We've already been executing the plan uh, to get fully staffed as we enter the heart of the operating season. And and uh, um, you know, we've actually probably seen some, some media around some hiring um, that we're doing uh, currently and, and a media push to actually um, – to bring in more employment uh, on the seasonal labor front. We're doing job fairs, we're doing advertising. Uh, so so I think we, we're confident we're going to get there uh, by the heart of the operating season. And it's already been good progress since uh, since March. Uh, but I think there is, uh, to some extent, wage pressure, uh, the demand supply dynamics. And But the thing about the wage pressure is it's not new. I mean, we called it up on our Q419 earnings call, uh, and where we do need to surgically adjust wage rates, we're doing it as necessary, but only when we see a clear uh, financial return, like uh, in per cap growth and, and, and value and revenue. And, and I think overall uh, what that means is we're very comfortable that this was all within the, um, the construct of our adjusted EBITDA target of 530 to $560 million, and, and we continue down the path of uh, getting there. And and this is one one piece of it, but uh, we feel we'll get past it both from a uh, supply of labor hours perspective as well as from a profitability standpoint. I think we're pretty pretty comfortable that we have it covered. Okay, okay, very good. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank Thanks. you very much for the caller. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of James Hardiman with Wedbush. Hey, good morning. Um, good morning for taking. Morning. Um, really good quarter here. I, I, the, the, the number I wanted to hone in on was this um, attendance level of, of 79% versus uh, 2019 year to date. Is, is that a comparable number? Is that an apples to apples number? I, I appreciate sort of putting it at a place where the calendars are comparable. Um, but I know you talked about opening some parks um, a little bit earlier than you did in 2019. Is, is that a similar number of operating days as I compare those two numbers? So, so, so James, I think um, the headline is it is very comparable for the open parks in terms of a trend rate. And, um, 
It's about 79% year to date after you include Easter and spring break in both years. So it's, that's relatively like for like in terms of the events. Uh, from an operating days perspective, it's kind of a mixed bag just because of what we've actually been dealing with in this past year. We talked last year about all the um, innovations that we've actually brought in, uh, including holiday in the park events that we had, drive through, walk through events, which were unique in nature. They were so successful, we continued them into January. So you got more operating days from that. And, and then I think from a timing standpoint, especially against 19, you had saw our Texas Park basically uh, wasn't open early in the year, but we were open in 21. So it, there's, there's puts and takes uh, like that in terms of operating days. They're not all created equal. Uh, but I think when you think about the bulk of the, of the attendance, that really starts coming in once you approach Easter and the spring break. And, and that's, uh, that's when it heavies up. And the majority of the weight of attendance comes from that time period, which is why we highlighted the 79% year to date, because it really smoothed out the, the majority of when the attendance was occurring. And, and I think that, that trend rate is a very good indication of where our trend in attendance is going on open parks right now. Okay. And I guess my um, follow-up there would be, um, I think through the fourth quarter call, um, you said that attendance was pretty similar to, to the fourth quarter, which was about 50%, I think 51% of 2019 levels. Um, now, I know, you know, through February, there's, you know, there's a lot less weight to that. But I guess if I think about 79, uh, 79% year-to-date here in 21, have the last, couple of months, maybe the last month, been significantly better than that? You, you hit it on the head, uh, James. Uh, you're exactly right. Um, to, to get from uh, roughly the same as Q4 to 79% year-to-date, we have to have performed significantly better in the last couple of months, and that has what has happened. And that's precisely what we're talking about. We've been seeing a significant acceleration in trend um, as we've actually gone into – Post earnings call of Q4, and um, and that that is why we we said we expected to see a pent up demand. Frankly, the level of pent up demand has exceeded our expectations, and uh, and the direction is very very encouraging. Got it. And then maybe last uh, follow up to my follow up. I apologize um, to that point about pent up demand. I mean, obviously, you've still got some. Um, parks that need to open up. You've got still some caps on attendance uh, in some of your parks. But if I just think about, uh, maybe this is an unanswerable question, but do you think there's more demand for your parks in 21 than there was in 2019? Um, so, so, James, I think it's uh, it, it's pretty early uh, to make that call. Uh, it's, it's clear that people haven't really had the access to to parks uniformly across the nation that they do that they are likely to have now, and so the pent up demand is very strong. But we really only know that as we get into the summer in terms of what the magnitude will be. The direction is very clear based on what they're saying. Uh, what I will say is, while the pent up demand is very strong, I think Mike alluded to it in the prepared remarks as well. The key is capacity constraints. And, and certain certain states like Texas, Oklahoma, and Georgia, the capacity constraints have been lifted, and, and they're operating uh, essentially uh, with no capacity constraints, and we're operating very safely, and uh, and we're able to deliver the experience that that we would like to deliver our guests on that. However, I think in certain states, California was an example. I think it came up on an earlier question. There are restrictions, and, and I think that puts a, a limitation on a good guest, guest experience at some point with the capacity restrictions that we have, including things like wide throughput. So um, so I think that is going to be uh, what we need to get past. But I think Eric asked the question, June 15th, once capacity restrictions are lifted, does it change? Yes, it does. Then you can actually realize more, more full demand. But I think as we go through the summer, it's going to probably happen at varying times across different states, different parks. So uh, it isn't quite clear when it's all going to happen. And and so I, I'd say 
2019 uh, was a very normal year. 2021 is not a very normal year. Demand may be there, but the the parts to actually realizing that demand uh, is not as linear as um, as it would be in a normal situation. Really great color. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you. And James, uh, James, and maybe for you, and you know, just as I'm tracking the questions, a couple of different thoughts here. You know, first, uh, I think it's important uh, that everyone understands we've learned a lot about our guests during COVID, um, and that has focused us on unique visitation and making sure we deliver products and promotions for different cohorts. So, for example, Safari and many of the special events. Uh, we've executed, we're going to continue those going forward. And as we said, where we have a safe product and it's cash flow positive uh, and it drives uh, that unique visitation and positiveness, we're going to do it. Um, and we've also leveraged our revenue management team. Um, the, the second thing I would say, maybe a little bit more specific to your question, we got to remember that our parks typically operate an average of 50% of the theoretical max capacity. So that does provide us ample capacity uh, to meet what we see as very consistent and improving demand across all geographies. Um, and we've proven, uh, and we've been selling this to all the states and the counties, we've entertained over 8 million guests since the pandemic. And as, as we've proven we can do it safely, uh, they are collaboratively working with us as uh, the CDC moves, as vaccinations move. They, they want to help us expand capacity. Uh, so we'll continue to do that, and we'll continue to safely uh, operate as we uh, capture that demand. Really helpful. Thanks, Mike. Your next question comes from the line of Ian Zafino with Oppenheimer. Hi, great. Thank you very much. Um, you know, just, just wanted to uh, ask one more question on the labor side. You know, I know you mentioned that you think it's going to abate over, or at least the shortage is going to abate over time. Um, you know, why is that specifically? I guess because a lot of the headwinds you had mentioned, um, you know, seem like they're going to persist for, for, for some time. So um, is it just a matter of you have more time to kind of find people and turn over every stone? Or kind of, you know, what's driving your confidence in, in, in your thoughts that it's going to abate? Thanks. Ian, that was a, that's a really good question, and, and I think uh, the key is is part of the um, the driver that we mentioned of why there's a labor shortage. It's school schedules, um, and frankly, as schools close for the summer, um, a lot of our employees that, on the, from a seasonal labor standpoint, tend to be school kids who are looking for uh, work over the summer, and and that will be a big unlock in terms of um, labor supply. And, and I think that's why we expect that come, come uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, we, we should be in pretty good shape with that, that supply basically being unlocked. Okay. Um, and, and then just on, on the M&A side, I mean, where's BidEsk right now or, or how has COVID sort of changed or at least some potential targets, you know, went through COVID. Obviously, that was pretty rough for them. Has that changed the dynamics of, of M&A and sort of how are you thinking about it now? Yeah, uh, Ian, it, it's Mike. Um, I, I'll just uh, give you a consistent answer that I uh, uh, provided on the last earnings call. Our first priority is to invest in our base business, our park infrastructure, uh, from a capital allocation and our transformation and strategy is all about profit from the core. That's our focus. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Brett Andrus with KeyBank Capital Mark. Hey, uh, good morning. So uh, good morning. a few more questions. Uh, a few more questions on the 79% versus 19%. Uh, I guess first, is there any way to break that down, <clears throat> excuse me, by region? Um, I, I guess I'd be more interested in uh, what some of the southern, maybe less restricted uh, parks did. And then second, to, to your earlier answer that March and April trended above, uh, that, you know, that's 79%, uh, which was implied. Is there any way to quantify what, what, what March and April maybe were uh, versus 2019? So, 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 Brett, I think the first part of your question really was, um, was there variation across geographies? And the answer is broad-based and good. 
um, and consistently good across all geographies, not specifically region by region. Uh, and the second is, what, what I would say is it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to quantify uh, March and April. We're not going to get into that sort of level of detail. But to do the math, I mean, if we were at close to 50% uh, in the first couple of months and and now with another couple of months gone, it's about 79%, it, it had to have been pretty good uh, in March and April uh, for it to have uh, gotten to the 79% number. So uh, very strong, very strong and a significant acceleration. And um, And I think as Mike said in the prepared remarks, uh, a great demand came with its challenges because uh, of some of the labor issues that we had, and um, and I think uh, we're we're fully cognizant of where things are at right now, and we expect a very robust demand going forward. And that's why I've been looking at the other day trend and saying this is a very good indication of where we're trending from a demand standpoint at this point. Got it. Okay. And then second question, more of a, a modeling question. I mean, we've never had to model uh, a 4th of July shift uh, for Six Flags before, I think. Uh, so is, is there any way to frame up, um, you know, what kind of impact that, you know, could have or, or, or will have for you this year? Um, maybe just putting some um, some some bookends around it. Yeah, I think from a trend standpoint, just like they've given you the color that, um, that they're giving you right now, you're, you're going to have that color when, they, when we report Q2, uh, including the 4th of July. So from a from a modeling standpoint, what I would say is, just like you saw the attendance value shift from Q2 to Q1 for about 293,000 uh, with the uh, with the calendar shift, you're going to see um, those days go out of Q2, and you're going to see uh, the four days in July come into Q3. So order of magnitude. It typically is a much bigger event in July 4th because it's in the summer versus around Easter. So you're going to see a net benefit in terms of value of attendance in Q2 as a result of the shift. Um, and and I think the, the the headline I would say from a trend standpoint is we will basically normalize and give you the normalized attendance trend as we uh, as we as we report Q2. All right. Thank you. Okay. And your last question comes from the line of Alex Morocco with Berenberg. Hi, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my question. You touched on this a bit, but I'm trying to learn more about the labor constraint impact on customer experience. Which parts of the park outside of food and beverage will be most heavily impacted by continued labor shortages? And then how are you working with customers to make sure they understand the impacts? Alex, uh, good morning. Uh, so I think it's very uh, consistent with uh, what we said. We're being, uh, first of all, we're on the, the labor specific to availability. We're being uh, very focused uh, by type of functional uh, work and what the competitive market is and, and assessing that. And so we, we've got a very good plan in place. Uh, Sunday said we've got a lot going on right now, uh, last week and this week with National Hiring Week. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second is we, we've leveraged technology to, to deal with the problem. And this was even uh, at the, big, the early part of COVID, when you think about it, uh, the way we've been able to address this is we've just allowed a lot of technology to provide contactless entry. Our, our front gate process is significantly faster than it was before. Uh, we've used mobile dining uh, and mobile dining only pickup areas, uh, and we've communicated that to the guests in the park. Uh, we've been very proactive in signage and in other ways to let them know that. Um, and we'll continue to do that. So it's, it's predominantly technology. There, there's other parts if you look at uh, things like the reverse ATMs and games. That's also been a big enabler of faster experience in parts of the park. Um, we've also done work with uh, FlashPass to accelerate that process to reduce waiting. So there's, there's a lot we've been doing with technology, and we'll continue to do that. Okay, that's helpful, Mike. And secondly, you mentioned in the prepared remarks that you've spoken with and surveyed some guests to get 
feedback on, you know, just their general thoughts right now. Have you asked anybody about guest entertainment preferences once we see a lot of other options open to full capacity, such as sports stadiums, movie theaters, and some other places? Yeah, so we 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 survey guests every week, Alex, and with the the consistent feedback we are seeing is our guests uh, broadly and out of home, uh, they want safe, uh, they want fun, uh, they want thrilling with coasters, uh, and it's real important to them to be outdoor and a drive away from that experience, uh, which is why we feel very good the way we're positioned. Uh, with the demand where it's coming from. Uh, but those seem to be the very consistent uh, themes that we're seeing from guests, and it's been very consistent. It's very broad-based across all the geographies as well. Got it. Thank you. And there are no further questions at this time. Uh, thank you for your continued support. The essence of our transformation plan is using technology to create an improved and personalized guest experience. We are solidifying our connection with our guests from the time they purchase their ticket all the way through to their online visits. Six Flags is truly the preferred regional destination for entertainment, creating fun and thrilling memories for all. Take care and we hope to see you at our parks this summer. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.